So welcome and uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Beatrice Dupuy and I'm co-director of Circle. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar already with Circle, uh, we are one of 16 language resource centers uh, funded under Title VI by the US Department of Education. And our mission is to develop and provide uh, quality instructional materials and uh, professional learning opportunities to language educators. Uh, Circle is housed in the College of Humanities here at the University of Arizona. And for more information about what we do and what we offer, you can uh, go visit the links that are uh, at the bottom of this slide. So today's webinar is the second in a three-part series focused on rebooting language education. The last webinar in the series will take place on April 18th and will focus on extended reality in language instruction. If you're interested in finding more information about this webinar, you can scan the QR code or use the URL at the bottom of the slide. So coming up, uh, we also have two in-person uh, events. The Language Teacher Symposium on April 27 uh, will be a workshop led by Ben Fisher Rodriguez, and will focus on creating an LGBTQA plus inclusive learning environment for all learners in the language classroom and beyond. Dr. Kathy Schwartz and her colleagues, Dr. Doria Klecker and Narjes Zandi will lead a two-day institute on reading globally, engaging with youth literature on immigrant and refugee experiences. So if you can't attend this for these uh, in-person events, please mark your calendar. So it is now time for me to introduce our presenter. Dr. Ilka Kotka is teaching professor at Northwestern, uh, at Northeastern, sorry, University in Boston. She teaches English uh, language courses to undergraduate and graduate international students. She develops and evaluates language programs. She manages graduate courses and supports instructors. She received a PhD in bilingual uh, education from New York uh, University, where she examined ways uh, of teaching source-based academic write, uh, writing to multilingual learners. Dr. Koska's current scholarly activities focus primarily on approaches that support English language learning, such as the flipped uh, learning model and computer-assisted language learning. Over the last over the past year, she's been incorporating generative AI in her work by experimenting with various tools, planning workshops for faculty, and conducting research with colleagues. Before teaching English as a second language, Dr. Koska was a, a German language instructor um, at universities in Connecticut and New York City. She's also taught English in China and lived and studied in Germany. She's currently a secretary of Northern New England TESOL and serves on the board of directors of Literacy Volunteers of Greater Worcester, which provides literacy and language instruction to immigrants and refugees in central Massachusetts. A webinar uh, presentation today is entitled Generative AI in Language Education, Rewards, Risk and Reboots. Ilka, thank you again for accepting our invitation to present today. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Beatrice. And hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, thank you so much for the warm invitation. I'm so excited to talk to you all today about the potential of generative AI for language education rewards, risks, and reboots. And I'm really excited to see that there are educators joining us from so many different places around the world. I think it shows how much of an important issue AI is that's affecting our field. And I'm really excited to dive in. So here we go. I'd like to start by talking about my journey into generative AI with my language teaching. And it started back in early December, 2022. I was on a Zoom call with a colleague and we were discussing another project. And he asked me, have you heard about ChatGPT? And I said, no, I thought it was a website or maybe some other kind of tool. And then when he showed me how it works, he did a screen share and I saw how quickly it could produce an essay. This was pretty much my reaction. Yes, this is generated by Dali. Um, I remember that feeling first was it was fear. I thought, okay, you know, now students might not need me anymore. Um, I felt a little sense of panic and just kind of knew that this would be a real game changer. 
But once the panic subsided, I became really curious and I wanted to experiment with ChatGPT and learn more about it and try it out. Um, and I wanted to know also if my students were using it and if they had also heard about it. I was teaching two sections of a graduate listening and speaking course in the spring 2023 semester. And I asked my students, have you ever used ChatGPT? This was in late January. 68% of them said that they had. And by the way, I pulled them anonymously. I also asked if they had accounts. And at that time, about 55% of students had accounts. So they already knew about it um, earlier than a lot of my colleagues did. In the fall 2023 semester, and I'll get back to this a little bit later, I did a research project with my colleagues and we surveyed students in our graduate and undergraduate English language programs. So 101 students participated and we wanted to know if they were using AI and what they knew. So 100% had heard of them, had heard of ChatGPT by September, 2023. 74% of our students had used it and 73% had their own accounts. So as I was beginning to experiment with ChatGPT and, and work with the tool and try out different prompts, I thought, okay, well, I think I'm pretty tech savvy, right? These are some of the tools that I use in my teaching. I like to experiment with new programs and use them. I thought, okay, well, I, I can figure this out. Maybe it's not so different, but I think it is. It's the same kind of animal, but different in, in many, many ways. So let's take a look. And I'm going to focus today a lot on ChatGPT because that's the program, the platform that I started with when I started using Gen AI. And that's the one that most of our students use, as I said, and um, the one I think it's most popular in our program. So it's available to the public. And I think this is why there's been a lot of attention in mainstream media, as opposed to other educational tools that are not discussed in the media. It requires little technical expertise. It's pretty easy to use. It's versatile in that it can do a lot of different kinds of tasks, anything from giving you writing help to creating images. The output is, is pretty good. It's not perfect, I'm gonna get back to this idea later, but it is informative and it is coherent and it's not completely off the mark in most cases. Uh, you can customize the output, it works in, in a quick way, it's fast, and at least the uh, GPT 3.5 version is free. So going back to the spring, I started using it in my classes, talking to students about it in a very kind of open way. I was using it myself. And then in the summer, my colleagues and I offered some workshops for faculty, not only in English language teaching, but across the university, because we wanted to bring everyone together to have discussions about how Gen AI, how ChatGPT and other tools would impact our teaching. Then I, I wrote an article about it with one of my colleagues, because for me, when I'm writing an article, it really encourages me to do a deep dive into literature and to really think about topics and ideas. So we wrote an article that was published in TESOL EJ. Then in the fall, we conducted this project together where we did some focus activities and, in class with our students across five different uh, sections and different courses and wanted to see students' use of ChatGPT and what their attitudes were towards our use of ChatGPT for class activities. Then I've been teaching since then. And then now this semester in the spring, I'm conducting research with a colleague that's focusing on faculty. So we're going into classrooms, we're observing, taking field notes, conducting interviews with faculty to learn about their attitudes and their uses of um, AI. And all the while I have been trying to learn as much as I can and read and try to upskill and keep up with the insane amount of information that is out, out there on, um, on AI. So as I've been talking to faculty, I have heard a lot of the same kinds of questions in on social media or after presentations or just in informal discussions. Why is there so much hype about AI? What do I do if I think a student has cheated with AI? Should I just ban AI in my classes? I'm not techie and don't have time. Can't I just live without it? I think AI is unethical, so why should I learn about it? Can I just use detection programs to identify AI-based writing? And this last one is where we're gonna to start today. I'm overwhelmed and this is all scary. How do I begin to understand all of this? So I think by the end of the webinar today, you'll have an understanding of these questions. I won't address them directly one by one now, but again, by the end, I think you'll have um, an understanding. So it is overwhelming. There is a lot of information out there. Where do we start and why are faculty overwhelmed? 
I think it's because they're, and I want to acknowledge the emotional aspect of innovation, of change, and particularly with generative AI, AI more generally, it stirs up emotions. There's a lot of fear, fear about the unknown, fear about what's going to happen in the future, what might happen to our information. And there is, Lo says, a dread of seeing a profession that's deeply rooted in human connection and interaction, like ours, being taken over by machines. Darby says, this was an article published in November 2023 in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, said that faculty tend to fall into three main groups. And this aligns with what I have seen by talking to faculty over the past year or so. The first group are the enthusiasts, those who are very excited about AI and they embrace it and they want to use it in their classes. There are those who, the, who are the resistors. And I've seen uh, this as well, where they think that we shouldn't even be talking about the potential of using AI in, in education at all. And then somewhere in the middle are the realists who understand that yes, there are risks, there are possible benefits, but this technology really isn't going to be going away. In fact, it's going to proliferate and continue to develop. So we might as well try to understand it. So I would like to see how all of you are feeling. Um, you can join slido.com. This is going to be a word cloud. Slido.com, you can join and put in this pin or you can scan the QR code. But I would love to know one word that you have that describes your feelings towards Gen AI in language education. And I just want to emphasize that whatever you're feeling today at this moment is perfectly fine. Um, but let's just wait a minute and we're going to see the, the words come in right here on the slide. Curious, excited, concerned, skeptical, jazzed, yeah, ambivalent, worried. Yep. Excited, excited, it's coming up, and curious, it's coming up a lot. Yeah, cautious, pessimistic, annoyed. <laughs> Terra incognito, yep. Hopeful, intrigued. Excited and curious seem to be popular answers. Ready to roll, okay, fascinated, love it. Not enough evidence, stunned, okay. Let's see, disappointed, perplexed, worried, yep. Excited but worried, widely used, yeah, love it. <laughs> All right, a few more seconds, I'll let you, let you join. Realist, okay, apprehensive, right. Every time I do a poll like this, I see a range of emotions and I think that's totally normal. We have the spectrum of people who are excited and curious and intrigued versus those who really have very strong concerns and are very scared and worried about. And I think, again, all of that is okay. Today, my goal is not really to convince you either way, but to provide some information in which you'll have um, the knowledge that you need to make decisions and think about your own um, approaches towards using Gen AI and language teaching. Thank you for participating. There's another one coming at the end. So we're going to explore and critically examine the role of generative AI in language teaching. I'm gonna be drawing from the literature that I've been reading, from the research that I've been conducting in my programs and my own experiences teaching English at the post-secondary level. And the focus today is going to be, I'm going to take a, a bird's eye view of this topic. So not really going into uh, the details and the features of specific tools and how they work, but really looking at larger questions, the implications of Gen AI for language teaching, pressing questions that we'll have to continue thinking about as a field, and then applications to teaching. And you'll have the chance to interact through polls, through discussion breaks, and through a Padlet. So here is the link to the, I'm sorry, this is the QR code, and then we'll put the link to the Padlet in the chat. Um, I, get, I will share this slide at the end, but I thought, let me share it at the beginning, because then you can maybe use it as a, a tool to take some notes. If you have to leave early, then you can still have access to the Padlet. Um, I would like you to think about three takeaways from today, two questions and or one topic you'd like to continue exploring. So the Padlet is my way of interacting with you because we're not in the same room 
And I would love for you to, again, have a place where you can collaborate with others and see others thinking on it. And I will be checking it uh, today and I'll be checking over the next couple of days. So again, a way to for all of us to interact. So please take a minute to open it up if you'd like to open it on your phone or on your browser, either way is, is perfectly fine. But I'd love to hear from you. Whatever you'd like to share is wonderful. And all you have to do is hit the plus mark under each of these three categories and you can post. All right, I'll just give you a second to get to the Padlet. All right, looking forward to checking it out when the webinar is over. Okay, so before we begin, I'd like to make sure that we all have a shared understanding and go over some key concepts. And let's start with the very basic one, AI. When machines or software can perform tasks which usually require human intelligence, such as problem solving. So AI resembles human thinking, like reasoning and prediction, but it's not really intelligent. Bender et al. call it um, a stochastic parrot. They use this term. Like a parrot, it can mimic, but it doesn't really understand language and meaning. A large language model is an AI system that's trained to generate human-like language, can generate either text or, or speech, and it's built from the text that's, that's fed into it. So there's an old saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out, whatever goes in is what's going to come out in the output. And as I'll say later, this has important implications for, for bias. Generative AI is a branch of AI that creates new content in response to prompts. So the content can include images, text, videos, slides, poetry, recipes, art, music. I mean, so many different kinds of things. You, If you've used ChatGPT, you'll see that this is what it looks like. There's a chat box, you put in the prompt, and then it gives you a response. Bing Copilot is another example. You put in, um, so here it says, ask me anything. You can put in um, a prompt and it will give you an answer. And Gemini by Google. It used to be called Bard, but they just renamed it recently. So now it's, it's Gemini. So it can create images. And um, this is uh, created by Dali, which is from OpenAI, the same company that produces uh, ChatGPT. This was um, an image I created of students collaborating. There's another, another example of an image creation platform called Crayon. Gonna look closely though, because it doesn't, it's not as nice as ChatGPT or I'm sorry, as Dali. You can see some of these people here are missing arms and the quality is not as, not as high. I'll get back to that later. So let's just break for a quick discussion. I would like to know in the chat, um, how much technical expertise about Gen AI do you think language instructors need? How much do you think we need to know about how these models work, kind of the more computer science element, the backend element, how much technical expertise do you think we need? Any quick answers would be, would be great. Very little, enough to know when it's being used, a fair amount, enough to make critical decisions, right? More practical experience, exactly, yeah. Yeah, the basic understanding, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people say that prompt engineering is going to be the new and very important skill for the 21st century, but I think that these, these platforms are so easy to use that you can just keep tweaking prompts and kind of get the hang of it. Um, you don't have to be an expert, I think, in prompt engineering to get some output that you want. All right, let's see what else. Yeah, basic knowledge, right? Yep. Enough to critique and also observe biases. Exactly. That's what we're that's what I'm getting at with this uh, with this question. Okay. So I'm going to talk today about the rewards, the risks, and how we might use Gen AI to reboot language teaching. We're going to start with the rewards. So first, and this is probably the big one that you might have heard, is that we can use Gen AI to increase efficiency and provide personalized feedback. So in terms of feedback, you can ask, keep asking follow-up questions, much like if you were talking to someone who was giving you feedback, you can create tests and quizzes, save a lot of time. You can minimize your workload. Let's face it, teachers spend a lot of time preparing for class. And in all honesty, a lot of my Gen AI use is on this back end part, is the preparation for class, creating materials, adapting materials to different language levels. I'll show you some examples of that. 
customizing content for language development. So this is a colleague of mine, Brent Warner, based out in California. Um, he just wrote an article about how you can create images to practice English idioms. So it's very difficult to find images of each idiom you might want, but you can use um, one of those image creators, like maybe Midjourney or Dali, to create an image to get exactly what you want and then use them as the basis of, of uh, activities in class. Developing second language skills, so using, um, using Gen AI to explain vocabulary, using it to adjust the complexity of text or to translate text, so to make them either simpler or more advanced, tailor them to your students' levels, and this is what I've been most interested in is thinking about how we can use Gen AI to innovate and to enhance what we currently do. So not necessarily to revamp our teaching, to start from scratch, to throw out everything that we know works well, but instead to think about this question of how it can help us do what we're doing better. And I'm gonna show you that with my example of flipped learning. And this is a short book that I'm working on with two other colleagues. Um, on Gen AI and English language teaching. I think a big opportunity here is that if we're using ChatGPT or other tools in class with our students, we can position ourselves as collaborators with our students and build trust with them and talk about these tools in an open and a transparent way to get away from sort of that us versus them um, approach and instead explore together. And I found that's been very effective in my teaching. And I'll talk about, I'll show you some examples of how I've done that before. So the goal here really is to support what we're doing, not to have Gen AI replace everything that, that we do. So here are some examples from my classes. I like to use TWE to, um, TWE is for English language teachers to create materials for my class. So the Danger of a Single Story is a TED Talk that I have used many times in my listening and speaking classes. You can put the YouTube link in here and it'll create questions, warm-up questions. They could be open-ended ones, uh, true, false, multiple choice, and you can adapt the level, beginner, intermediate, advanced. So this is what it looks like and it just saves me a lot of time in preparing for class. You can use it for vocabulary study. So these are collocations, list the most common adjectives that come before the word evidence. What I like about this is that you have the collocations here, but then you also have the descriptions of them. So um, very useful in my class. Also with collocations, this is an example from Gemini. The difference here is that Gemini categorized the collocations into groups, which is something that I, I do in class anyway, but it's already done for you. I think it will help students remember if they're grouped together by a theme. So words um, related to evidence, you can talk about strength or validity or impact or quantity. And you can listen to the to the to Gemini say these words, pronounce these words for you. You can also do this in German. So you can ask um, this, I think this is from this is from Chat GPT. Ask it for vocabulary words and cognates from a reading. But again, we have to check it. Um, so some of the words like Proraden, I think is not used as much as the word Umzüge. So we always have to check. And that's gonna be a running theme today is that we always have to look at the output, but still I think it can save a lot of time. I use it to, to create customized dialogues. This was for a workshop that I did for adult learners and on the weekend, and it was about small talk. So create this dialogue very, very quickly. We focus on word stress and again, save me a lot of time. You can also use it for language explanations. So um, different ways of talking about the same grammar point. For example, this one is about German word order, which is typically tricky for a lot of German learners. So here you have some explanations. There are some sample sentences, just a, a different way of explaining something, right? So if we're explaining word order in German, this is another explanation in different language with some examples that can support our explanation. You can level a reading. So um, Deutsche Welle is a, is a source that I used a lot when I was teaching German, you, but a, a lot of times when I was teaching beginner German, the levels were too difficult. So we can translate really any article into simpler language that beginner learners can understand. And you can ask ChatGPT to use as many cognates as possible. And in English and German, there are, there are many, many cognates. So let's take another discussion break. What is a teaching related issue that AI could help you address? For me, it was 
the, the factor of time. When I was teaching German, it was um, you know many, many years ago, not having as much access to lots of tools uh, or resources in German on the internet. So what's something that you could use AI to help you do better, a teaching related issue? Just take a minute or two, provide feedback, grading, materials, workload. Mm -hmm. A little resistance, okay, sharing ideas and lesson planning, finding appropriate materials, right? Customizing the materials, again, that's what I use it a lot for. Activities for lessons, examples, discussion questions, right? Providing feedback, leveling text, planning, lesson planning. Creating models, right? Creating models is, is really nice. Yeah. A lot of times you're looking for something, you just don't have it, or it would take you a long time to develop and you can have Gen AI do it for you. You just need models a lot. Modifying tests. Okay. Writing emails. I'm going to talk about emails today. The AI explanation of German word order is very selective, not exhaustive. Yes. There were actually many other Prompts, that was just an example. I showed the first three, but it, I think there were 10 total um, of explanations. Thank you. All right. So let's move on to the risks. We really can't talk about Gen AI and the benefits without also thinking about the risks and challenges and concerns. I categorized the risks into two categories. The first is more about AI generally, and the second one is focused on faculty concerns and focus on education. So let's start with AI risks. There's the, the possibility of misinformation, so inaccurate information and disinformation, right? Disinformation which can, um, mis which purposefully misleading and can obscure the truth. And because AI models are, are trained on existing information, this information can make its way into the training data, which has tremendous conse uh, consequences for healthcare, for political elections, for many other context. Hallucinations makes up information that looks right, but is not, that is wrong. Um, bias, yes, bias based on toxic content based on, you know, race and gender and age and religion, um, sexist content, homophobic content has made its way in. And Liang et al., this is a study that was done in China with English language teachers, saw that there's um, the, the possibility of false positives with second language writers on the TOEFL essay. So it um, incorrectly identified the students writing as being AI generated when it wasn't. Uh, the unreliability of detection programs, I think the Gen AI community of educators, the general consensus is that these programs don't work. Um, universities have tried, to, I think in schools have tried to get them to try to find AI content, but they just, they just don't work well. Perpetuating stereotypes and discrimination and deep fakes. So using someone's face, putting it on other images. And that's already happening, unfortunately, in school. So very, very worrisome. In terms of faculty concerns, from what I've been reading, academic integrity is at the top of the list, right? So the question of, are students going to be cheating more because they have these tools? How about um, also the ethical use, uh, concerns about data, how it's analyzed, uh, how that impacts educational use, whether there's informed consent for students' data, how their privacy is protected, um, how user, user data is monitored, um, so who's using the data, when and where. Uh, concerns about teacher readiness, so are teachers ready? Do they have the resources and the time and the support that they need in order to upskill, to prepare, to build their own AI literacy skills. Uh, this was this Gao et al. study was done in China. It was just recently published, but it was a study of English teachers in China. And one of their concerns was that students would rely too much on Gen AI and not problem solve or think critically on their own. Concerns about equity and access. So who has um, access to these tools? A lot of them are behind paywalls. Um, you know, is it is it equal? And then concerns about the impact on the writing process and on critical thinking. So what happens if we rely on AI to write? How does that impact our thinking? So this is a phrase that I have heard a lot the past year from fellow faculty. You know, I've been chat GPT'd. I guess it's becoming a verb, but um, you know, questions of what happens when you suspect that a text or something that a student submitted 
was not really written by that student. We can't really prove it. Um, the, again, the detection tools don't really work, although at Northeastern, we don't have those tools. So what do you do and how do you um, address it? Questions about writing an assessment. So this is an example of a French text where you have to talk about you know, where you're from, um, you know, talk a little bit about your life and so on, maybe hobbies. So the question is, if students are translating something that they should be writing, you know, is, is there a problem with that? And I guess it would depend on what the goal of the task is. If the goal is to have them write in French, then it could be problematic. But if the focus is more on the content, then the question is, you know, does it matter if they're using translators? So lots of things to, to think about. Um, concerns about critical thinking. So I taught in a uh, writing class for graduate students. I've taught it many times in our program. And we have students read academic articles in their destination discipline where they will be studying after they leave our English programs. And with, now with uh, PDF.ai, it's an example where you can put in a PDF and it'll summarize it for you. It can You can ask it critical questions, the questions that we wanted our students to be asking when they're reading. It can give you the answer. So for example, is any information missing? What questions could someone ask the author about this article? It could all do it, do it for you. Here's an example of stereotypes. So I just quickly put in to Dali, um, create an image of Germans enjoying the weekend. And this is what it came up with. Um, our students saw these stereotypes firsthand in one of the assignments in our reading and writing class last fall where they had to write a personal narrative and they used ChatGPT in class with the instructor to produce a personal narrative and it came up with stereotypes. So for example, our Chinese students were, were upset to see that ChatGPT said that Chinese students are, are good at math, right? These stereotypes, and they saw that firsthand. And then there was a discussion about it in class. They saw firsthand um, how these stereotypes are, are built in. Uh, going back to the issue of equity. So what happens if a student has access to DALI, which you have to pay for versus the free version? Um, again, a lot of these programs are behind a paywall. You have to subscribe and pay for them. And it begs the question of if, if all of this is unethical and risky, then why should we be using it? Or I guess, should we be, be using it? And a lot of people would say that this is the future. This is an IBM report that said that we will need to prepare students for the future workforce. Uh, executives in their report estimated that 40% of the workforce will have to reskill. There's this notion of inevitability that it's out there, it's gonna be part of our lives. Even if we don't use AI actively, then we will be impacted by it. And at the same time, it's leading to this need for AI literacy skills. So if it's going to be expected in the workforce, if we will be impacted by it, um, for example, when we go to the doctor's office or we're doing online baking or whatever the case is, if it's inevit inevitable that it's going to continue to proliferate and develop, then we need the AI literacy skills to be able to keep up. So here are some pressing questions that I hope that you will continue um, thinking about, but these are questions that I'm still thinking about in terms of kind of broader visions of our field. We have to ask ourselves, what does learning mean today in the year 2024? What's new about language teaching and what stays the same? What is the role of homework in learning? I'm gonna be talking about this one when I talk about learning. What kinds of policies are needed regarding AI use? Um, maybe surprising, but not surprising, that there's still a lot of universities that don't have official policies, or if they have policies, not every faculty member has put that policy into their syllabi and or discussed it with students. So still a lot of inconsistency there. How does assessment change? How do assignments change in light of all these developments? Do we ban these tools? Do we wait for further guidance or do we start adopting them? And where's the line between getting help and having AI do the work for you? So let's pause for another discussion break. What are some other questions in addition to these that are raised for you in terms of your teaching, your learning and or your research with Gen AI? And these are also questions that you can put into the Padlet. But what else do we have to think about as a field? Can AI replace teachers? Mm -hmm. Is it becoming the next excuse not to learn world languages in the US, right? Can you 
Um, how can I encourage students to use it responsibly? All right. You don't want to create a personal account, but you can operate it. Yep. Um, make it student centered. How will people really learn a language? Right. Exactly. Lots of questions. Privacy. Just kind of scrolling through the chat. Right. Excellent questions. I think, um, yeah, will affect job security. How do I cite AI content? Yep. Right. So I think um, these are these are questions that we're still thinking through. We're still really in the early adoption phase. I think a lot of these answers we don't have. They're questions that we can continue um, thinking about. So now I'd like to talk about the practical. This is the practical part of the webinar, rebooting. I put this image on here. If you're familiar with Star Trek, you'll know that there was a reboot of the original TV series from the 60s. And I kind of think of this in a similar way with language teaching, at least with my teaching. So can we reboot? Can we refresh? Can we keep what works um, in the sort of the old ways, what we know that has been effective and refresh, keep a lot of the same topics, the same themes, the same methods and um, innovate and enhance what we're already doing. And this is a question that I, I continue to ask myself as I'm planning for instruction, what can AI help me do better, right? Um, do I need to use Gen AI for everything that I'm doing? I don't wanna use it for a class activity. If it's not going to really enhance the lesson or be useful for students, um, so keeping this question in mind, I think is, is important. And I think I found the sweet spot, at least I'm definitely working on it, where within the field of English language teaching, I have been implementing flip learning for almost 10 years now. And I'm gonna explain all about flip learning in a second, if you're not sure what that is. So I've been flipping my, my classes and I have found a place to embed critical AI literacy to develop students' critical AI literacy skills within the flipped learning approach, which I have used to help me teach academic English. So I've been trying to think of how I can build on what I'm already doing in the classroom. And Bergen and Sams are the two, they're often referred to as the pioneers of the flipped learning approach. They remind us, and this is not about AI at all, this is about flipped learning, but they remind us that pedagogy drives technology use, not the other way around. And if we're gonna be using technology or Gen AI, and it's not going to enhance what we do or there, there's not a purpose, then I think we shouldn't use it. It really should be to help us do something better. So I'm gonna show you how I've helped it. I've used it to help me implement flipped learning. So a little bit of context. I am at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. I teach in our undergraduate and graduate pathways programs. Our students are international students. They have conditional admission to Northeastern if they successfully complete our program, which is uh, for most students, this is determined with a particular GPA for their destination program, depends on which program they're going to after, but they need a particular GPA. So they're taking a combination of English language classes and content courses. And the content courses are the ones that transfer for credit. So they'll take calculus. They're actually taking um, public speaking this semester that transfers to their undergraduate degree programs. Um, in our graduate program, students take a course in their discipline, so they'll take project management or a leadership course um, for credit, and then they're with us for either one or two semesters, depending on placement. Our undergraduate students are with us for two semesters for fall and spring, but our graduate students, they can join for either one or two semesters. I, I took this photo recently. It's very, very cold, though it's warming up here in Boston. And I've been using a flipped learning approach for many years now because I wanted a way, I, I started using flipped learning because I wanted to prepare students for the TOEFL, which nine years ago was a requirement for students to exit from our program. They needed a particular GPA, then they needed a certain TOEFL score. I wanted to prepare them for the TOEFL, but I didn't want to take a lot of class time because some students had already passed it and they had the score they need. Some students needed a lot of help and wanted to spend the whole class on TOEFL prep. And some students were somewhere in the middle and I wanted to use class not to go over test prep, but to help them work on their reading and writing skills. So I started implementing flipped learning. And this is what this is a common definition by the Academy of Active Learning and Sciences, the most commonly used definition in the field. It inverts the traditional classroom model by introducing course concepts before class. 
allowing educators to use class time to guide each student through active, practical, innovative applications of the course principles. And what this leads to is more student-centered learning, less teacher-led instruction in the classroom. So out of class, students learn the content. They can learn through print materials, such as through a textbook or readings. They can watch videos or they can engage with interactive videos. And I have an example of that. Those are my favorite. And then in class, when the teacher doesn't have to explain the content and stand at the front and explain a grammar concept, for instance, then there's more time in class for the students to apply what they learned outside of class. And ideally, they have understood the content. They're ready to apply the content to projects, case studies, group work, collaborative writing, which is what I do a lot, analyses, debates, pretty much any kind of interactive, collaborative activity. So flip learning is a way of organizing where learning takes place. But when we flip instruction, we're also flipping Bloom's taxonomy. So traditionally in class, students might uh, work on comprehension and remembering, and then outside of class, they apply what they've learned. But then when we flip, then uh, Bloom would flip Bloom's taxonomy. In class, they're doing the harder skills of evaluation and synthesis and analysis, application. And outside of class, they're doing the sort of less cognitively demanding skills like comprehension and remembering. So before I show you some examples of my class, I'd like to show you how I introduce Gen AI with my students and really try to use it in an ethical and transparent way. I always start the semester by giving an overview of, um, of learning. And we talk openly with students, my colleagues and I, about the purpose of education. Like, why are they there? Why do they want a college degree? Why do they want to learn English? Why are they studying in the United States? Then we discuss privacy issue and personal, uh, personable, personally identifiable information, PI, PII. Um, so I always, you know, I tell my students that they can't put any personal information into ChatGPT or other tools, nothing that they wouldn't want to be shared. So for instance, um, their name, email address, any medical information, financial information, if we're doing an activity in which they have to use Gen AI, then I allow students to opt out because I don't want to force them to create a ChatGPT account if they don't want to. Now, as I said earlier, a lot of our students have accounts already, um, which I knew, but I have some workarounds prepared in case they don't. So if there's a, and this is, it hasn't happened yet, but it might, if there's a student who doesn't want, doesn't have a ChatGPT account, doesn't want to use it, then they can join a group of students where there is an account or they could use my account in my computer in the front of the room so they don't have to create an account. Um, I show students how to turn off the chat history. So this is in chat GPT where um, chat GPT won't take your data to train their models. So show them you know, where that is so they're aware of it. And then I collect feedback from students. I do this anyway. I always wanna hear from my students and hear about how much they've understood the lesson, get their feedback and how we can make things better. So I'm always collecting feedback from students in general, but I also collect anonymous feedback from them on our use of Gen AI in class. So their input is really important. And as I'm gonna show you in these activities, I emphasize the critical analysis of output. This is so important that I want them to understand that you can't just take the output and just use it and believe it and not think about it. So this is how, I'm gonna show you how I've tried to do that with some class activities. I'm going to show three sample lessons from three different semesters. The first one was on delivery skills, and this was back in the spring. The second lesson is on email etiquette last fall, and then impromptu speaking is a lesson that I did very recently this semester. So let's start with delivery skills. This was in a graduate level listening and speaking course. The objectives were to, for students to be able to identify elements of effective delivery skills. So body language, for example, using gestures, um, dress, things like that. Evaluate chat GPT output and then compare and contrast the output to their prior knowledge that they recalled in class. And the reason why was because um, presentations are common. Students had to do an impromptu speech, so they had to 
learn how to give a presentation, you know, or give a presentation at the end of the semester. And then in their graduate programs, presentations are common. So impromptu speeches were a part of the course. And then we knew based on talking to faculty in their destination programs that we knew that they'd have to give presentations in the future. So outside of class, I use Edpuzzle, which is embedded into Canvas. I had students watch a video that I created. You don't have to create all your own videos for flip learning. You can use them. Um, you can create your own or you can use YouTube videos or videos from other faculty. But I had them watch the video at home. And then in Edpuzzle, it's, uh, intera it's, there are interactions that are built in. So students stop the video. They can't move forward until they answer the questions. So I'll show you a little bit more about that. So this was the question of, you know, is it okay to face the screen and point, um, point at the screen when you're presenting, you know, and that gives you the, the correct answer there. There are other different types of interactions in Edpuzzle, just kind of um, quick overview. So you can build in multiple choice questions into the video. Um, so like true, it, well, it's multiple choice, but it's true, false. Um, they call it true, false. You can add audio files if you want to leave students a note. You can ask them open-ended questions and then you grade it at the end. They're, they don't grade themselves. And then you can ask students to record. And this is really nice with the recording feature in a speaking class because if the video focuses on intonation, for example, then they can record directly into Edpuzzle and practice using intonation at the end of a speech or at the end of a sentence or in a list or whatever the example is. So I kind of like that feature there. Um, so they're built into the video. Again, um, students, if you select the feature, they can't go on until they've answered the questions. They can't skip ahead. They can't also play the video and go to another browser. So they have to answer the questions. So then students watch the video about delivery skills outside of class and inside of class, I had them brainstorm what they remembered from the video um, again, they they had they did the interaction so I could see how well they did. If they missed a point or if something was unclear or I saw that they really kind of didn't understand something, then it just didn't happen in this class. But what I usually do is do a mini lesson in class or review it or do something where we can review the material that they learned outside of class and make sure that it's clear. So here they had to recall what they learned about delivery skills and compare and contrast their knowledge with ChatGPT output. So what is ChatGPT? What did it say about delivery skills? And then they talked about things like tone of voice and props. So ChatGPT, for example, example, recommended that you use props and students questioned that and thought, well, you know, is it appropriate to use props in an academic presentation in class? Usually no, I mean, I've never seen it. I've never used props. They talked about tone of voice and they kind of really looked at the chat GPT output and it led to a lot of really lively discussions about the content. It led to them um, having to recall what they had learned at home and not just talking about these items, but talking about why they may or may not be appropriate. So great class discussions. The other one is email etiquette. And I have been teaching students how to write emails for many, many years. For some reason, it's one of their favorite topics in my reading and writing courses. I'm not sure why. I guess it's because they write a lot of emails and um, we need to get it right. So the objectives were to identify, have students be able to identify parts of an appropriate email. So what makes an email appropriate? What needs to be included in terms of structure? Apply those skills to write an email. And then last fall, I added on this critical AI literacy piece building on to what I had been doing before. So I wanted to strengthen their critical thinking skills and build their critical AI literacy, literacy skills. For this one, um, I wanted them to, um, I'm sorry, not draw from the schema. I wanted them to draw from the schema, but develop their creativity and critical thinking. So outside of class, they watch two videos and these are not interactive videos. They're just regular videos. Take notes and complete a handout that they submitted to Canvas very low level on Bloom, their comprehension questions. And in class, I like to use Google Docs to have students work on collaborative um, writing assignments. So I'll give them a prompt, uh, a scenario. So for example, you're a student, you're requesting an extension, you're asking for a recommendation letter, you need to request an excused absence because you're sick. So pretty typical scenarios, things that I usually get over email and then have to work together to, um, to write this email together and then they present to the class. 
And then I had them have, uh, I had them use ChatGPT to do the same thing, to put the prompt in and to write an email and have them really analyze it. And one of the reasons why I did this is because I had a suspicion last fall that some students were using ChatGPT to write emails. Whether or not that's appropriate is, you know, another conversation, but I can tell that the students didn't, you know, probably didn't write those emails by themselves. So I had them look at language, look at use, look at the formality and style and the length. And here's an example of something that they commented on. They said the sentence is too formal. Um, I can read it for you in case it's not clear. In light of these, so this was an email, again, requesting an extension. In light of these challenges, I kindly request your indulgence in granting me a brief extension of three hours to ensure that I can deliver an assignment that meets the high standards of our course. So it's likely not you know, something that a student would say. I think this is language that I personally would not use. I think it's very formal. And they, they talked about, you can see right away how long this email is. Um, and then we had really interesting discussions about why this matters, right? So what is, the, what is really the consequence? You know, an email is not graded, right? It's not really plagiarism, I guess. There's, there's no grade, it's not a formal assignment. What does it matter, right? What might be the consequence if a student uses, uses ChatGPT to write an email? So a lot of times students have said that they, they use it because they wanna be correct and they wanna have a perfect email. So we talk about the balance between form and grammar with register and the impact on the relationships between you and your recipient and what might happen. And they say things like, you know, your recipient, if it's a professor, they might think you're lazy if you're not writing the email on your own. Another, I remember another student said that the professor might think that if you use ChatGPT to write emails, that professor might wonder what else you're using ChatGPT for. So it might raise red flags. So really interesting um, class discussions about what, why all of this you know, matters. And for this particular activity, this was one of the focus activities that we use as part of our research project. So I do have some feedback from, from students on this activity and others. And they said that um, you know, ChatGPT can help us get some answers faster, make the class more efficient. It provides detailed and clear answers to the students, which enhances student understanding of the class content. So I think one area here is that they, they're they understanding the kind of student-centered element that can be enhanced with ChatGPT. Another student said, um, and again, this is just one example from the data, I feel like it should be used as a tool instead of seen as a threat. It does not work for personal critical thinking responses, but as a quick way of research and idea organization. And my colleagues and I were happy to see that the student recognized that it's a tool. I'm gonna get back to that, that idea at the end. Um, yeah, that it might be good for certain things, but not work well for other things. And we were relieved to see that the student recognized that as well. And this is the critical thinking part of using Gen AI, using these tools. A student said it's efficient enough to give us quick answers, but it's up to us to judge its accuracy. Its answers are not 100% valid. And I think this is exactly what we want to be doing with students. We want them to use it, to maybe experiment with it, but then to critically analyze it. Okay, so the last activity I'm gonna share is one on impromptu speaking. This is in an now undergraduate class. Um, I wanted students to identify the principles of the PREP method, which is a framework for giving answers when you're speaking impromptu then apply this method to deliver an impromptu speech in class. So this one I, I didn't want to draw from student schema and I'll, I'll tell you why. I didn't want them, I didn't want to give them a topic in which they already knew about. I wanted to give them a topic that was very new. Um, so they really had to think on their feet. They had to make decisions. They had to be creative and not draw from any kind of prior knowledge. And you'll see why in a second. So. Um, and again, enhancing their creativity, their critical thinking, it's the goal. So as part of my flipped learning approach, here's an example of how uh, outside of class, students watched a YouTube video. And this is from Toastmasters International. I don't create all the videos myself. Sometimes I find really good YouTube videos um, or videos that could be really created through news sources or wherever you, you can get them from, could be a podcast. 
So they watched uh, this YouTube video on impromptu speaking. This is the prep method. You make a point, you give a reason for your point, you give some examples to support it, and then you conclude with the point um, again. And you'll notice that this video is five minutes and 47 seconds. A best practice in flipped learning is to keep the videos short. So um, we don't need to assign 30 minute lectures. Ideally, the videos would be 10 minutes, sometimes 15, but really no longer, I think what's best for students is no longer than 10 minutes. Um, and then each video that they watch should be centered on one specific topic. So this one was about um, the prep method. And uh, the benefit is that students can watch these videos really anywhere outside of class. They can watch them while they're eating lunch or while they are taking the train to come to campus so they can keep engaging with the content. And then in class, so I use a mix of approaches to yeah, to measure their comprehension of the material that they work on outside of class. So I showed you Edpuzzle before. Those were interactions that students um, can engage with so I can see how much they've understood and how well they did. Sometimes I'll give short quizzes, like with the email etiquette example, I have them fill out a handout. So there are many different types of things you can do, but what's really important is to measure their understanding. Um, it also holds them accountable to doing the work and to taking it seriously, but it's important for us to get that information on how well the students did. Because if none of them understood the content, then we can't really do the in-class activities until they have. So this one was just a short quiz from textbook readings and from the YouTube video on the prep method. And then in class, I showed the slide after they took the quiz to review the prep technique, right? And then I said, you know, why is it important? It can prevent rambling, helps you organize ideas and help you increase the coherence of your speech. And then this is the slide that I showed to students. They had to come to the front, look at the image and plan their speech 30 seconds, and then describe the image using this prep method, using the framework. And these were the images. So I had, I generated these with uh, Dali. And again, I didn't want to give um, topics or images that they might be familiar with. I wanted to really challenge them to be creative and think spontaneously when they were at the front of the room, much like they would do when they're doing an impromptu speech um, in class. So I gave them, I, I put these kind of crazy prompts into these really fun prompts into, into um, Dali. And I worked with a colleague on this. So as a side note, she taught a graduate level listening speaking class and used the same images, but she used them to develop hooks, um, to, to help students practice developing a hook for an introduction in a speech. So we use the same images, but we adapted them to different, you know, to different learning objectives, what we wanted to do. So this was the first one and students had very creative um, explanations of these images. Uh, I did give them some key words just so vocabulary would not be um, an obstacle when they were speaking. So, you know, if they don't know the word flamingo or pancakes, I put them on the slides. Here's another example of karaoke microphone, this is in a library. Um, and just as an example, one student said that um, the book was singing, was so happy because the book had been read and was done with its work, so to speak, didn't have to be read anymore um, and was free to go and sing. And the other books were happy too. So the kind of the moral of the story was to finish your books, make sure you finish reading. So they had just really, really creative um, answers. So I asked them, and. Again, this is anonymous feedback. I asked them what they thought about this activity. And this was before spring break. So you know, kind of the middle of the semester when students are tired. Um, it was really fun. Uh, most of them, they enjoyed it. 72.8% on a, on a scale of one to 10 said they thought it was, it was useful. So I think it was effective. In my other class, 80% of students rated it, you know, eight, nine, and 10. Um, so students uh, enjoyed it. They said that it was fun. They said, you know, they all had different images. So when at, when one student came to the front of the room, they had no idea what their image was going to be. So it's that element of surprise that kind of kept them interested. So my personal reflections on this activity, I'm kind of always thinking about, you know, what I'm doing. I think what worked well was that I did plan this with 
another instructor. She's the one that I present a lot on and I'm writing the book on. Um, we co-planned our lessons. We shared our lesson objectives. We worked together on creating the images, which saved us time. And then we reflected on how well the lessons went and what she noticed and what I noticed. So collaboration is a really important part of any, any teaching, but especially with Gen AI, I'm going to get to that later. I think what worked well was Dali. I could customize the images. So if I were to spend time looking through Google or some other kind of um, public domain images site to find these images that I wanted, it probably would have taken so much longer, but I was able to get them very quickly. With Dali, I had some scaffolds built in so students were able to see the timer. Uh, we, did a, uh, we did one together in my second section, not in the first section, but I did give them a cheat sheet. So I wrote the word prep um, on a large piece of paper so they could see it. Because again, this was the first time they were doing the prep method in class. And I think what worked well was the audience participation. So I encouraged students while they were listening to their peers to also brainstorm and think about what they would say while they were looking at any particular um, image. So I tried to involve them as much as possible. I think next time what I could do is, is give them a handout and have them fill out some ideas that they had and some things that they would say if they had the flamingo or if they had um, the book in the library doing karaoke. And it was fun. Um, there was a lot of laughter. They were smiling. It kind of took the pressure off the impromptu part, which, which is difficult. Impromptu speaking is hard. And to do it in a second language is even more difficult. I completely understand that. So um, I think making it fun for the first time that we did this impromptu practice in class for them was a win. And I think it also worked well for having them think critically, think on their feet and make decisions very, very quickly. Uh, what can be improved? I would practice with both of my sections and um, I did another impromptu speaking activity this past week. And we, we did one together. We did um, an image together. We kind of described the image together first as a model. I did that, I have two sections back to back and I did that with the second section having learned from doing this activity was my first section. So kind of run through one together to kind of get them thinking about it. So it was fun, it worked really well. Okay, so let's pause here for another discussion break. Which of these activities do you think could work in your teaching setting? What are some adaptations you could make? So for example, maybe you're not going to give students these really kind of off the wall images of a flamingo making pancakes, but is there a way you can use an image generator to carry out some other kind of activity? Um, what other adaptations um, could you make? Take a few minutes, I'm gonna pop into the chat and just take a look. Yeah, use images to learn vocabulary, practice vocabulary, right? Right, practice vocabulary. You could practice a grammar point. So if it's adjectives, you could ha have two images and have students compare them. Use images to narrate a short story or create a story, right? These are all great ideas. Um, I love the prep speaking activity. A lot of my students push back against speaking, presenting in class. Yeah, flip could be an alternative. Right. So the, again, this was a public speaking course. So this was the, the main goal of the course is to practice uh, speaking and to strengthen students' public speaking skills. So um, let's see. Yeah. Practicing vocabulary. Yeah. Planning lessons. Mm -hmm. Storytelling from images. Right. All right. So not just images, but you could think also of the email etiquette activity. Is there any kind of text that you could put into ChatGPT or another tool and have students analyze? And like I said, um, my colleagues worked on personal narratives because that was a writing assignment that students were doing in one of our undergraduate classes last fall. So they had ChatGPT write a personal narrative and then analyze that. So really any text I think could, could work for that. Yep, you can use it as warm ups to prepare for a big presentation, right? Yep. Right. Someone said, What's the real benefit of AI in the example you presented now? Creation of non standard standard art. We can use a real Dolly painter for that sake. Yeah. I think the benefit is that, um, you know, I wanted to create something that was really, really different from what they might have schema for, something that they might already know. So I don't think anyone here would ever think of a bunch of bananas and a boat in a fruit you know, Fruit Island, which was one of the images, I didn't put on the slides, but that's one of the images they had. 
So they really had to think um, creatively. I think that was really the biggest benefit versus showing them a painting that they may or may not already know, or it could be a painting of something that's pretty typical, like a landscape. Um, but this was really something that they very likely have never seen before. So I think that was kind of what I was trying to accomplish. And that was the the um, the impetus for it. And also to have fun, to have fun. Okay. Okay, so now what? I like to, I like this image because I think this really shows where we are now with Gen AI that, that the, you might have heard other analogies like the horse is out of the barn. For me, it's the toothpaste is out of the tube. I really don't think um, we're going to be going back. It's already out there. We know students are using it. We know these tools are developing. So where do we go from here? And I'd like to leave with some uh, recommendations uh, that I have developed based on the research and based on my own teaching and talking to fellow educators. So the first is to learn and upskill. So when I started my Gen AI journey, I really did not know a lot of the, the language that is used to talk about you know, Gen AI, like a large language model or prompt engineering, didn't really have this vocabulary. Um, but in order to use it and and to use it, to think about how to use it in class, I had to kind of learn all of this myself. Um, I think the good thing about all of the information that's out there is that there is so much. There are so many online resources. There are webinars. There's literature, literature, academic literature, like research, empirical research is scarce, but it's slowly developing. Um, now there are studies that are coming out in, in language education, empirical studies about Gen AI, about faculty attitudes, student use, um, so it's developing. There are a lot of blog posts, uh, other kinds of scholarship. I'm reading a little bit outside of my field. Um, I'm reading a book by Brian Christian called The Alignment Problem, kind of about um, these issues more generally, not necessarily about education. There are a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, one person I like to follow on YouTube is Ethan Mollick, who's a professor at Wharton, Wharton Business School at UPenn, and uh, lots of videos and, and podcasts available. And LinkedIn for me has been very useful. So I've been following a lot of educators in our field who post a lot about the work they're doing with Gen AI. They post teaching tips, they post articles and links. And um, I found that to be a very valuable resource and I've uh, connected with a lot of other educators just by getting to know them through LinkedIn. So some of my favorite resources, and I will uh, share a handout that will be posted along with the recording of this webinar of some of my favorite uh, resources that I like. So the Digital Futures Institute at Teachers College at Columbia has an interview series with different faculty on different um, issues related to Gen, I, Gen AI, which I think is, is very interesting. And Stanford University has um, a resource online that they are constantly updating. So you can see lessons, lesson plans there and readings, it's called Craft um, to Build AI Literacy. So those are just two examples. Um, there is a lot out there, but I think that's a good thing because we're all trying to figure, figure all of this out. So learning and upskilling, and this is also equally important. This is what has helped me come up to speed with all these developments, to learn about new tools, to try them in my class is to collaborate, collaborate with fellow educators, with other stakeholders um, at your institution, with educators that are outside your institution. Collaborate on all or some of these, I think has, is very, very valuable. Collaborate on a research project. Um, talk about teaching ideas, very much like I did with my colleague when we were creating those images. Um, share ideas for lessons and activities, and then reflect afterwards on how they how they went. Just having informal discussions with with your colleagues um, is very useful. Exchanging resources, so sending articles, sending links, saying, "Oh, did you see this? Did you read about this? Do you know about this tool?" And then giving presentations together. I think when whenever you collaborate on anything, the final product is always stronger. So I just get so many ideas and learn so much from just by working with other people. So these are some ways in which I think I've actually done all of these um, in which I have collaborated with, with my colleagues and then not just collaborating, but also sharing out. So sharing your knowledge with 
with um, other faculty, other instructors at your university, outside your university, publishing. There are so many ways to publish, at least in TESOL. Um, there are newsletters for the uh, the interests, uh, intersections within the organization or publishing on social media. I mean, so many ways to get ideas out there and to get feedback on your ideas. And the last one I'd like to end with where I started was I dove in. Again, um, this was all very new to me when I started doing work on Gen AI and doing research that I just kind of dove in. I opened a chat GPT account. I started playing around with the prompts and just took the plunge. I just wanted to get in and see, you know, what, what it could do. Um, so if you're interested in this, if that's what I would say, if you haven't started, you can start by creating an account and just diving in and seeing um, what you find. Yeah, so um, I think this quote is sort of comforting, at least to me, the only bad way to react to AI is to pretend it doesn't change anything. I think we are at a point in which we can't deny that these, these tools are out there, that it will not disrupt education and language education, especially in a major way. So um, however we try to understand it, I think is a great step forward trying to talk to others, to read, to upskill, to experiment on our own, to talk to students about it, um, to try to make sense of all these changes, I think is, is extremely uh, valuable. So what is the future of Gen AI and language education? Um, I would like to ask this question to you before I show my, my response. I'd love to hear, what do you think is the future? Where do you think we're going? What does all this mean for us? Let me take a look in the chat. Yeah, we need to be aware of the shortcomings. Yeah. Yeah, where do you where do you think we're going? What do you think the future is? Speeding up learning, cross disciplinary learning, better ways of understanding faster, accelerating progress, stereotypes and lack of culture. Mm -hmm. Integrating it into teaching, sharing the teacher load. Right, more individualized learning. Mm -hmm. Someone said it'd be very fashionable for a while, then fade down, then become one more tool in our toolbox. Very interesting, right? There does seem to be, it does seem to be very popular, a, very much a buzzword, but I agree that I don't think that it's really going to be dying out anytime soon. Unavoidable, just like living with Google Translate was. It's worse now that it's ever going to be, it's just going to get better. Okay, help us work more efficiently and effectively. Challenging for teacher preparation programs, they need to update, right? I, I agree with this, that um, if students are gonna be using these tools and if we are going to be preparing students for their futures, then we have to kind of teach the teacher. And that was really the main motivation behind our, my spring research project now is that I wanted to understand how faculty are using it, with the goal of developing a kind of framework that can then be shared with other faculty. Because if we can teach the teacher, then I think we can reach students. So yes, I think this is going to have to be integrated into teacher prep programs. Unemployment for world language instructors, I hope not. I think that, um, I think that language instructors are needed more than ever because there are some things that AI will never be able to, to do for us, to do in place of us right, to build relationships with students, to motivate them, to understand their needs, to create a welcoming learning environment, to design all of these activities that can foster learning. So I have hope that language teachers will be even more important maybe than before. Chatbots teaching our classes. <laughs> New skills, standardizing pedagogy, you know, giving students more ways to practice, reducing workload, assessment has to be re-envisioned, right? Yep. Early retirement. <laughs> yes. Thank you all for your input. There's so many messages. Wow. Okay. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm going to share what I think the future is. And again, at least this is how I've been conceptualizing my own Gen AI use is that it's a tool. It's one of many tools in my teacher toolkit, right? It's not going to replace me. It's, I don't rely on it completely for every single thing that I do related to my teaching. It's good for certain elements, but for other elements, I sometimes even use pen and paper for activities. So 
um, it's one of many things that we can um, that we can draw on when when appropriate when it's going to help. So let's go back to this uh, Slido and think about the word that you put at the beginning, the very beginning of the webinar. Um, the word you shared about your feelings towards AI and language education, has your feeling changed? Why are we not? So this is uh, text. You can put your name if you want. You don't have to. But please go back to Slido, put in the code, or you can scan the QR code. And we'll see the text that's going to come up on the slide. But yeah, have your how have your feelings evolved about um, Gen AI? Would love to, to hear. Feel more educated, further excited. Collaboration, ambiguous, more hopeful, still optimistic. That's good. Okay. Eager to use it. Still skeptical. That's okay. I think we should always be skeptical. We should always be critical. I think that's a healthy place to be, right? Yes, it's innovative and exciting and we're curious, but we should still have a critical eye. Yeah, still be skeptical. Skeptical. Even more curious. So curious and optimistic are coming up. Empowered. Maybe we will survive. And I think hopefully we'll do more. We will thrive. <laughs> Not just survive. Right. Ambiguity. Yeah, how has your feeling changed? Excited and worried? So you're wondering how I'm going to use all these tools. So I'm not saying that you should, um, I wouldn't recommend that you use every single tool that I talked about in this webinar, but start small. And this is actually the same exact advice that I gave educators when I was talking about flipped learning many years ago. Start small. Start by flipping one lesson, one activity, and see how it goes. Don't completely overhaul your whole curriculum or your whole syllabus. Start with an activity. Implement flip learning, see how it goes, collect feedback, tweak it, talk to others, try other activities. But um, there's that saying that a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And I think that's applicable here. Start small, again, not completely redo everything you're doing, but kind of try it out and, and tweak and, and see how it goes. So you so still excited. Take advantage in an ethical way and teach students to use AI in a good and honest way. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of um, there's this, I think, this idea that educators have that students are digital natives and they're tech savvy and they know these tools better than we do. But I think we're the experts in terms of the learning part of it. Right. The language learning element of it. Um, so that's where they would need our guidance. Right. The academic learning. So maybe they can use, you know, Gemini on their own. It's pretty easy to put in a prompt, but then they would need our help in how to use that to actually foster learning. So again, I still have hope for, for teachers. Okay, good. So that sounds, that sounds great. Thank you all for contributing to this um, poll. So I'd like to remind you of the Padlet. Again, I'll be checking over the next couple of days. If you leave the webinar and you think of something, you can definitely always go back to the Padlet. This is a way for all of us to interact asynchronously um, once the webinar is over. So three takeaways. Two questions you have um, and one topic that you'd like to continue exploring, feel free to add to any or all of these comments. I would definitely love to, to hear from you. We didn't have much time today and uh, there were a lot of questions in the chat. So I'd like to end by thanking you all. Please feel free to send me an email if you'd like to share some feedback or if you have any questions or if there's something you'd like to, to you know ask. I'd like to hear from you. And um, I wish you all the best of luck as you begin on this journey and continue thinking about the impact of Gen AI on, on our fields. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for joining. Really, um, really appreciate it. So here is a poll from um, Zoom, Zoom poll. We have a few questions in the Q&A that I might want to ask. I think some of it has been, uh, and I'll start with the, the latest, uh, somebody is asking if you might be able to uh, share the references that you included in your uh, presentation. Yes, I plan to make a handout of um, the references because I put them on the slide, they're very small. So I was gonna create a handout right. very much like Errol did. 
thought that was a great idea. And then put all the references there with links. So I'll be working on that. I'll send them to you and you can upload when the recording's ready. Yes. Great. Uh, an earlier question, so probably about 30 minutes into the presentation was, are there any frameworks to support language teaching and AI? Frameworks for language teaching? Not that I know of yet. <laughs> I think a lot of what anyway my colleagues are using and drawing from is from general AI frameworks, but that's something I hope to be working on is developing a framework for us for language teaching. So if someone knows of a framework, then I would love to hear it. But now I think we're still very much exploring and using um, resources from other fields. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think you already answered about, you know, how do we protect students' privacy and our privacy? I think you had something about that earlier, um, unless you want to expand on that aspect. Uh, I know there was a participant who was asking multiple times about, you know, whether there was an absolute need to create an account in chat GPT and so on. So, um, but I think others jumped in and answered that. So you mentioned that you actually have uh, led workshops for your colleagues uh, at your institution. And someone was asking, how can you convince those who are, um, not really um, on board and convince them that this is part of digital literacy, that using these tools are part of that? That's a great question. I mean, I try not to force these ideas on anyone or convince them that they have to use these tools right away um, because I completely understand the resistance. I do, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I understand that you know these tools are out there and our students are using it. And, I think we can't, we're not at a point where we can pretend that we can just kind of keep doing what we were doing with the same assignments like we were before. Um, but I think my goal in these workshops and, and with my colleagues, we really try to just give the information so faculty can make their own decisions. And if they're not going to be using these tools, I would say that at the very least, you should at least know about them, right? Know how they work, know what the potential benefits are, the opportunities, and know what the risks are and the concerns as well. Um, but to say, you know, but there's still, still some teachers I hear um, who say, oh, I've never used ChatGPT. What is it? Right. They don't even know about it. So I don't think that's where we can continue. We can continue kind of with that anymore. Um, again, you don't have to be an expert. You don't need you know, a master's degree in computer science, but we have to know about them and what they do and talk to our students and see what they're doing with them. Yeah. Great question. But I think if you're a little bit too kind of pushy then, um, you know, there'll be even more resistance. Oh. Uh, okay, so someone is asking, they have an administrator hat, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, say, they're asking, what can, should I do to support or train instructors, TAs, who teach lower division language classes in the use of AI in language instruction? So training TAs, yeah, I would start with the recommendations. Um, so start small. You can start with having a shared reading, starting with a possibility for an activity, starting if, you know, it kind of depends on everyone's knowledge base, but if there are some TAs who have never used it or don't, don't even know about it, start with the basics. Start by brainstorming, working together. There is, I'm going to say it again, but there's so much power in collaboration, especially with this topic because it is so new because it's developing so much and because people tend to have very strong feelings about it, this is something that we've really haven't seen or hasn't been on our radar as much as other topics, right? We're not talking about kind of typical language teaching topics like feedback or assessment. This is something totally new. So coming, bringing your colleagues together, bringing the TAs together to develop a shared understanding and then from there brainstorming, discussing it, visiting each other's classes in our research, this semester for me that has been really eye-opening is going and sitting in other professors' classes and seeing how they're using the tools, bringing students in the, into the conversation. Um, again, you can do this without the expertise. You can develop the expertise and the knowledge together um, in, a, in a, almost like a learning community. And that's, that's what we've been doing at Northeastern, just getting together and talking and doing workshops and exchanging ideas has been extremely valuable. So that's what I would say for TAs or really for any group is to get together, start small and, and discuss and learn and share resources. 
And maybe we'll take one last question because I know you you need to uh, to leave shortly. Somebody says, I feel like we rely on the assumption that Gen, Gen AI language output is still inferior to human output. For this reason, uh, activities in which uh, students look at Gen AI output and find its flaws make sense pedagogically, but couldn't a bit of prompt tweaking or uh, future advances result in AI that produces email that are about at the same level as a human need as a human native speaker. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'm sure we're going to get there. Um, there is a program out there that's just for email writing. Um, yeah, I mean, these programs are going to, um, to develop, but I think you still have the conversation about whether or not you should and can use emails to, you can outsource your own content because the emails I've gotten from students, some of them have been completely unrelated to the course. So they've been very vague or they're not even connected to my prompt or my initial email. So um, I think there's still room for that, but yes, they're going to keep developing. Yep. So I think that uh, we are at the bottom of the hour. This is uh, technically the end of the webinar. I think most of the questions have been answered. Uh, but if you have any uh, outstanding questions that you'd like our presenter to uh, uh, answer, you can always contact her at her email address and she'll be happy to uh, let you know what she think about a particular question that you had but could not be answered during this particular session. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And thank you to our uh, presenter for a really informative and very useful uh, presentation. Thank you so much, everybody. Good luck.